Working with a degree in landscape architecture from the University of Oregon, he worked in an office for 20 minutes before running out the door and beginning a career designing and building gardens on his own. It was an early trip to Spain and Portugal that introduced him to the art of mosaic. On returning home, he taught himself how to build his own pebble and tile mosaics and frequently uses them to embellish his garden designs. Growing up in Eugene, surrounded by a great natural beauty, added a profound, a profound appreciation for the natural world. Therefore, the gardens he builds are very complementary to the natural environment surrounding them. At the same time, they are places to immerse oneself in a setting of inspiring and meaningful beauty. Every winter, he rests his tired hands by traveling for three to four, four months in places that are the stuff of dreams. 14 winters were spent in Asia, 11 in South America, six in Mexico and Central America, eight in Europe and North Africa, and a year working on the South Island of New Zealand. These trips are like going back to school and the lessons learned are highly influential to his work, especially in regards to creating gardens for pleasure. Join me in welcoming Jeffrey Bale. So um, the first time I gave this lecture was in the um, Real Jardín Botánico in their auditorium in Madrid in Spain. I had been traveling in Spain and Morocco that winter and I met uh, a couple who had studied at Kew in England and they had become the directors of the garden and so they asked me to put together a lecture and so I traveled around and then when I returned to Madrid I had prepared this lecture. So this is um, this is one of the oldest botanical gardens in the world. It was built for um, to house the collection of the plant explorer Malaspinas, who traveled around the world. Um, his work was eventually just kind of wiped out from history because of political reasons, but it has an incredible collection, and that. Um, is right next to the Prado. And they had just finished restoring um, two paintings by Albrecht Durer, the German painter of Adam and Eve. So I'm gonna kind of start at the beginning here. So um, if you were raised Christian, you certainly know how this works, but uh, um, it's a very bizarre story. I just read the book of Genesis yesterday and it was so strange. <laughs> it's a lot of begatting and, um, but, um, Eve seems to, Adam looks pretty clueless here and Eve seems to be much more worldly and curious. And so she got talked by the snake into eating. Um, an apple is the most common depiction of the fruit, although there were a number of fruits. This is a painting by Bernardino Luini um, in the Chiesa di San Maurizio in Milan. And apparently Eden had hedges and there were buildings. <laughs> outside and strange topiary so and it looks like grapefruits but um flowing out of the garden of eden were the four rivers of paradise and so these um became a prototype for the chahar bag in persian gardens which means a four-quartered garden so you have um the four rivers flowing out of a central spring and then four garden beds and that became the prototype for um, you'll see it at the Balbo Park. Um, when you go into the Islamic inspired gardens, you'll see this kind of four quarter garden. This is a mosaic that I built in front of a, a very extravagant mansion in the Hollywood Hills in Los Angeles, kind of an interpretation of that mosaic. Um, apparently the humans, um, you know, Adam and Eve begat Cain and Abel, that didn't go very well. God wasn't super happy with the way society was going. I, I think we're kind of keeping up with that tradition, but um, so he flooded the earth and Noah, the, there were no mention of plants in Genesis. It, actually, all this happened very quickly. You know, they had saved animals, flooded the earth, but um, apparently the plants all survived. <laughs> so a little odd, but people were kicked. So Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden and um, people beca became nomadic and became 
began to um, populate the world and they traveled in caravans through the Fertile Crescent and across North Africa and built cities and around oases. And so the first gardens were built where there were sources of water and they built walls around them to protect them so that you were safe from wild animals and Marathi and you know, other people coming along. And so this is um, Ben Ait Hadoud in Morocco, which is a, one of a, a huge mud brick citadel on a river in, at the very edge of the Sahara. Um, this is a Persian painting of um, Persian royalty, the children of Persian royalty hanging out around a spring with a meadow. So this was kind of the idealization of what paradise was, was a source of water and, and beautiful flowers and fragrance and birds um, in a very arid climate. Um, this is the stream that was diverted into the Alhambra, the palace that was built in Granada, Spain for the for the um, dynasty, the last um, Arab dynasty that ruled Spain. And so they did this incredible system of building water channels, riddles that um, sent water throughout structures and to create irrigation systems. So these were, these were based on really old, like if they built a date palm plantation, they would build a well, plant the tree, and, and then there would be a connecting rill. This is the um, Patio de las Naranjas in Cordoba, and it's the oldest, um, one of the oldest intact gardens in its original state in the world. That irrigation system was translated into the architecture of the Alhambra palaces. So, so they had water inside the buildings emerging and then running through rills that is identical to the irrigation systems. Um, creating what, what is still one of the most beautiful gardens in the world. So this is, um, I have been to the Alhambra now five times and I've spent, I would just go for the day and just do a small section of it so I could actually experience things the way you're supposed to instead of racing through it. You, I sat here for about an hour one day and just watched the way wind blew across the water. Um, it's just, so water is like the source of life. And that became really a, an important aspect in my garden design. Um, this is the first time I went, I was, I think 25 years old when I went to the Alhambra the first time. You can't go near this fountain anymore. But um, I saw pebble mosaics there. Um, this one is particularly extraordinary because it has the shadows of the trees, the orange trees surrounding this pond. Um, replicated in mosaic. Um, I spent several hours sitting on one of those lovely little Arab chairs staring at this fountain in the Henna Alife. And I have blogs at jeffreygardens.blogspot.com where I've, I've, I've written extremely detailed blogs about the Alhambra and the Henna Alife, um, about how to build pebble mosaics, about several of my projects. And um, in the Alhambra, they, the windows go all the way to the floor and looking out at the views. And so there was a harem of women who were not allowed to go out into public that would only be seen by the Nazirs of, um, that inhabited the palace. And so they built extraordinarily beautiful surroundings for them because they were kind of kept kept captive, but, but what they did was they laid around, instead of sitting on couches and chairs, they put carpets down on the ground and you would lay there and, and take in the view. And I learned that that completely changes the way that you experience a landscape if you lay down rather than sitting, because it, makes, it kind of makes things unveil themselves. You, you experience things on a different level. Um, I love these patterns. Um, the eight pointed stars are two squares inter interlocking that represents time and space and the four directions. So it's, uh, so it's kind of a complete vision of, um, this is a fountain that the Spanish moved from a different location and built a Spanish style when Ferdinand and Isabel moved into the palace after they conquered the Arabs and drove them into Morocco. 
Um, and in Morocco, you'll see these chahar bogs. You know, so it's basically a cruciform path system with a fountain in the center. That would be the spring, the water of life coming out in the center, and then the four rivers of paradise flowing outward. And that's what makes the architectural form for these spaces. You can see this is a basin with an eight-pointed star in it in a painting that I found in Tangier. Um, this is the at the American Legation, which um, Morocco was the first country in the world to acknowledge the United States as the sovereign nation. So George Washington bought a um, Riyadh, a, a, a dar, a house in Tangier in Morocco, and it had an open trade agreement. And so this was the first property that the United States acquired diplomatically outside of the country. And it is still, it's the only um, site in the national park system that is not located in a US territory. And it has pebble mosaic floors with eight pointed stars in them. So this is um, a Chahar Bagh courtyard in that same American legation location. Um, also in Marrakesh is the, um, <clears throat> Majorelle Garden. This was a French artist that lived in Marrakesh and in the, the French area of Marrakesh, and he built this incredible garden, patented this color, and started a plant collection. But it was basically a place for him to paint, but also it's a pleasure garden. It's just it's just a really beautiful place to lay around, to sit, and just absorb the ambiance. You know, it has water in an extremely dry, hot, arid place. I heard that it was recently 120 degrees in Marrakesh uh, about a week and a half ago with global warming. This is the Hotel La Mamounia, which had just undergone a seven-year um, remodeling and restoration. And so I, I also wrote a blog about this because I was given a tour of, of all the architecture and changes that were made to the building, um, extraordinary spaces. Um, the largest Chahar Bagh possibly in the world is the Taj Mahal and the building is on one side of it, but there's a platform in the middle and then the four rivers of paradise flowing out in a cruciform garden. Um, the Romans and the Greeks and Romans had a completely different mythology. And so this, this is a painting that's in the Prado Museum in, in Spain and um, in Madrid. And it shows Apollo offering the nectar of immortality to Homer, the writer Homer who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. And he's surrounded by the muses and it's on Mount Parnassus and there's a cave on Mount Parnassus that a spring flows out of and the muses lived in the cave and the sound of water became the inspiration for art, music and poetry. So those, so the muses, it's actually water created um, those concepts of music and then poetry and art. So um, the, the Greek mythology was based on water was a very mysterious um, kind of substance that was very seductive. And so this is a painting by um, Waterhouse of um, Hylix um, being lured into a pool by the nymphs. And um, so they, so the Greeks believed that there were wild women who lived in the forest and they lived in harmony with nature. And they believed that actually like hunters would see these wild women and they believed that they became extinct during World War I, that they were actually finally killed off, but they had lived for um, several millennium in the forest. There were actually a race of wild females. <laughs> and um, so the Romans built nymphaeum. So that would be like a spring and there were niches and these contained um, statues. This is at in Rabat and um, in Morocco, but at these ruins. So, so many Roman cities had nymphaeums and there were sacred, sacred places where you worship these kind of wild women that lived in the forest. So um, this is at Bomarzo in Italy, um, a really incredible garden built by, I also have written a great blog about Bomarzo. It's worth reading for a, an incredible tour of this place. I was there in the winter and was the only person there. So this is a nymph standing on a dragon in a niche in the garden. Um, this is at the Villa de Este. And so the Fontana Ovada, which is one of the main fountains at the Villa de Este outside of Rome in Tivoli is, is, has, has nymphs emerging from the walls. 
of, of the spring. And um, this is the only one you can see. The rest have been grown over by, you can see these kind of green columns. There's a nymph inside each one of those, a statue of a nymph, but they've all been covered up. And in the winter, when you're there, there's almost no tourists. So you're not supposed to go back. You know, I climbed over a barricade every time I've been to the Villa de Este and gone behind the fountain because it has this incredible way of making the water zigzag as it falls over the, in the cascade. It's the most extravagant water garden in the world. And there's a water organ that plays music. So this was... Um, um, the Diana of Ephesus. So Ephesus is in Turkey, but it's a Roman ruin. And the um, principal goddess there was, um, was this multi-breasted kind of like a, she's covered with bees. So it's like a beehive basically, but the Pope came to visit. And so they had to move it from the central niche of the water organ because it was the main focus of the garden. And they put her back in, on a sidewall, kind of tucked her away because it was a little too decadent and pagan for, for the Pope's visit. So this is the wall of a hundred fountains. I mean, I mean, when I was in school, we had lectures on this. And so it was like one of my pilgrimages. And I've been back three times because it's so incredible, this garden. This represents the three rivers that flow through the region. Um, the most um, classic of the Italian mannerist gardens which were all built by cardinals who absconded enormous amounts of wealth. They were very corrupt and they built pagan pleasure gardens rather than religious, you know. They built pleasure gardens for themselves to party in, you know. They kind of privatized the Roman, the Roman sexual decadence that existed before Catholicism took over and, and Christianity. So, so this is a um, grotto where the water emerges in the Villa de Este. And it's very wild and pagan. And then it flows into four fountains that represent the four elements. So this is the element of water, the dolphin fountain. And then it flows down this, it's called the Catena de Aqua, a chain of water. And you can see these little bowls and they could put fruit or you know, offerings, flowers in these bowls to decorate them. But this is actually the tail of a crawfish, because the cardinal who owned this garden, built this garden was um, Cardinal Gambara, and Gambara means crayfish. So um, at the top here, you can see where the Katana de Aqua comes into this pool of the river gods. This represents the element of earth and between the claws of the crawfish. And then this is a table that has a channel of water running through it where they could chill bottles of wine. And then when all these friends of the Cardinal were sitting around the pool, they could dip their feet in the cool water that flows around the base of the pool. So they would have these sumptuous banquets and be, you know, and then this is the element of fire. So these are like little oil lanterns. And, and when the sun hit it in the late afternoon, it illuminated these water jets. So they looked like little, like flames. A really brilliant garden. Um, and then it opens out into this parterre, which represents man's superiority over nature. So we have this kind of egotistical need to conquer nature, which is backfiring on us, but, but it's very ordered. But you, but you see that this is a four-quartered pool. So it's actually based on the four rivers of paradise and a Chahar, Persian Chahar Bagh. It's divided into four quarters. Um, in South America, I spent uh, about five months in Peru. And so this is a um, agricultural test area built by the Incas called Tipon that still has functioning water channels running through it. And they, the water comes down and it divides into different channels. So to do ceremonial um, worship of water in order to be blessed by deities to improve the agricultural um, production of the crops. So. So I really love the way that water is used symbolically and ceremonially in these spaces. And so I've tried to, again, incorporate these things into my work. This is in the Botanical Garden in Bogota, Colombia. Um, so again, using these rills, which were inspired by both um, pre-Columbian cultures in South America and by the Europeans who came and colonized the region. So. Um, I live in the Pacific Northwest, so we have a lot of water. Um, this is a beautiful 
waterfall up the Mackenzie River, which is an area that was catastrophically burned last year and some horrible fires. But I think this, this area was not burned, but this is Proxy Falls. Um, lots of adiatum, pedatum, uh, maidenhair ferns and lady ferns. And um, so I grew up in Eugene. This is me and my brother. On Easter Sunday, we would always go up to Hendricks Park at the Rhododendron Garden. And they had this beautiful fountain that was a magnolia blossom. Uh, in a basin of carved granite um, with and the water spilled out of the tips of the petals of the flowers and I think this is one of the reasons I be, went into landscape architecture was because I was just transfixed by this fountain unfortunately they have torn this out for some reason so um, I think the fence rotted and they decided to remodel the area and the fountain is gone I don't know where it went I'm heartbroken by that but um, this is one of my earlier projects. So I started to incorporate fountains into all of my work um, because I think that this element of water, it's like the sacred spring. Um, this was a retaining wall holding up a driveway and then they had an asphalt walkway leading down to their, to their front steps and it was so ugly. So I just transformed it into this, um, to this lovely lush garden. And they had never gardened before, but they've become really good gardeners since then. So um, they take good care of it, which is rare. Um, this is a fountain that I built for another client. This was just the lawn. The entire front yard was a lawn. And um, so I built, we took all the grass out and I built this place because he had young children so that they, when they come home, instead of just going in the house, they could go and sit by this fountain. And the medallions I cast in a form the three medallions and we put them up on the summer solstice so it's facing south so we call it the solstice mountain and they're kind of like compasses they have the four the four directions and they and then kind of this explosion of energy representing the sun um, this is a fountain that i built for some people that lived on a busy road and they had a small patio up some stairs so i actually pre-cast all of this and then assembled it in the garden was able to move it with a hand truck to get it up there. And it's in a stainless steel basin that I had fabricated. Um, this is my garden. I spent six winters in India and I was I studied carving in the town of Mahabalipuram in South India. And then I started buying um, architectural pieces when I went to Rajasthan from buildings that had been torn down. So over three years, I shipped back about four tons of architectural pieces from India that are extraordinary. And these are two, 300 year old um, window frames and columns and brackets and things that I eventually assembled to build a wall in my own garden because the harems in the palaces in, in Rajasthan are some of the most sumptuous, beautiful, places I've ever seen. And so I thought, I want a harem in my own garden. <laughs> so, so I built this incredible thing. It took about two years to construct the whole thing. Um, I had mixed it with my a collection of beautiful stones that I've gathered all over the Pacific Northwest. So it's kind of a blending of, of the local geography with this exotic um, so, so it kind of bridges my my travel because I spend so I've traveled 38 winters of my life. And so I have kind of two lives. And so I kind of wanted to bring them together, my Pacific Northwest life and my traveling life. Um, I built a magical garden. And so I believe that the nymphs, the nymphs were drawn into the garden. And so I've had these incredible, you know, people come there and they want to do photo shoots and um, this, this woman came and did, um, I, I consider hummingbirds to be like nymphs as well. They're magical creatures. And so uh, um, there were no hummingbirds when I first built my garden. And now, I, now they nest in the garden. Oh, what happened here? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so, so every year I have a nest that I can find and um, they're made with spiderweb silk and I think they're just magical things. Um, I've built a number of fountains for other clients. This client bought a Kuan Yin statue. And so I built an altar and we bought these Rajasthani doors at an import place and built the screen behind it and, and set a mirror into the window frame. 
this that was such an ugly garden when I started. So again, it's like transforming something that's just really, really pathetic and just something lovely. Um, I brought the stone carvings back so that people could buy them and I could build installations, but I um, wound up, a lot of the pieces got broken in shipment, so I had to reassemble them and I wound up having a lot left over, which was great because I was able to build my wall. Um, this is a, this was a sloped lawn that we dug out and created a flat terrace and built retaining walls. And so they just sit and they love to sit out here and stare at the at waterfalls off a little shelf into this pool. Um, this is in the uh, Red Fort in Delhi. So this was Shah Jahan's palace. He was the man who commissioned the Taj Mahal when his wife Mumtaz Mahal died. And um, it used to have gold in the Pietra Dura that's all been picked out by people over the centuries. But I think this is the most beautiful fountain I've ever seen. You know, it's a lotus blossom, stylized lotus blossom in the water would actually flow from the edges into the center rather than coming out of the center and flowing to the edges. Um, this is a mosaic of a lotus also in, uh, this is in, Gr in Granada, in a courtyard in Spain. No, I am, it's kind of sticking. Um, this is, this was the first commission that I got for a major pebble mosaic. Once I had, um, I built a patio for myself and the people, I, I, often go into their house and ask, can I see, you know, your furnishings and the, your art and what do you read? Where have you been? What do you like? And they had a beautiful collection of, of Persian carpets. So the garden was really small. The property line is just a couple of feet from the edge of that wall. And so I said, well, since we're going to build a patio, why don't I make it like a carpet? And then when you look out the windows, when you're walking up the stairs through these beautiful leaded glass windows, you'll see this carpet. And it represents the um, birth of the universe. The lotus in the center represents purity because mud doesn't stick to a lotus. So Buddha is often depicted sitting in a lotus. And then, and then it's expanding out with 108 um, galaxies in the, in the universe, kind of the creation of the universe. Um, this is a fountain in Sevilla at the Alcazar with the eight point star again, time and space overlapping. And then these people decided they needed a garage because the neighborhood is so dense and they didn't have off street parking. So they built a garage next to the house that was underground. And I talked, the, talked them into throwing out the original architectural plans that had a gabled roof and we did a flat roof. So it was very expensive, but now they have this kind of Spanish style ballroom on their roof with eight pointed stars. Um, this is another eight pointed star in a garden. So, so that influence from the Mediterranean and another fountain. Um, there's another eight pointer star. This is in Los Angeles for I built the garden that I built for Brooke Adams and Tony Shalhoub, the actors. Um, this is in the front of my house. I spent three winters in Nepal trekking in the Himalayas. So these are my eyes looking over the threshold. I live in a crack house, a former crack house. And I have a little sign, it's a his, historic crack house <laughs> by my front door. And um, somebody was shot in a drive-by shooting on this spot where these eyes are. So these are my eyes watching over the threshold of my garden. And so you enter by walking over my eyes and I'm watching you. And there's a, an ammonite fossil in, for the third eye in the center that I collect found in the Kali Gandaki River in the, the deepest point of the deepest gorge in the world. And then there's a Tibetan endless knot and the next up the steps that represents um, the infinite potential of, of the world. So um, I've done a lot of spiral designs. This is, I was hired by a woman on Fire, on Fire Island in New York to do that mosaic. Um, this is in Portland and has become quite famous, this walkway. This, well, these people have a cabin in Eastern Oregon that they don't get to very often that has a actual hot spring stream running by the cabin. And so I did a mosaic to kind of recreate that stream um, leading up to their front door so that they could feel like they had a connection to this place that they love that's about an eight hour drive away from their house. So um, the little spirals represent little eddies of pools because the stream is very small. So the water just kind of trickles between the stones. 
and I used every color of sandstone that I could buy. Um, this is a staircase. This was a sloped lawn and the people were, they would, he would like let go of the lawnmower and it would like roll down the hill <laughs> and hit the sidewalk. And then he'd try to drag it back up. And after, you know, they just bought the house and they were like, this is really frightening mowing this lawn. So I took it out and built a set of stairs that looks like a stream cascading down the hill. Um, and this is Pietra Dura work, which is inlaid marble that you see in India. And these are cypress trees and tree of life. And this is a beautiful carpet that I saw that I love that has the cypress trees. They represent longevity. And so I created a mosaic in front of my house of, of this mosaic, um, again, to inspire, you know, this. so you have this representation of life and longevity. So, um, so everything that means something, I think it triggers some consciousness in you when you see it and you know what, understand what it means, then it makes you think about these these concepts. Um, there's a really beautiful, large sandstone statue of this uh, copy of the Sarnath Buddha. This is when Buddha gave his teachings to his disciples after he uh, attained enlightenment and behind him is the wheel of law. Um, the disciples are at the bottom here. And so that's, uh, that, so I had that shipped back from India and built a platform for that. Um, this is at the palace at Mandu in um, Madhya Pradesh in India. It's an incredible palace built at the top of the mountain by a very paranoid Sultan. And um, this is a, um, a cave that has shrines inside of it. And then the water that flows out of the cave goes into this double spiral. And at the very top, you see a line and that's a, a 400 foot cliff. The water just drops off. And so this, the water flows out of this and just creates this mist as it falls 400 feet down the cliff. Very profound, so, but, I, but I, spirals represent um, the world, everything in the universe is turning and expanding outward. And so it creates a spiral. That's why the Milky Way looks like a spiral. It's because everything's rotating around, you know, by a force of gravity and expanding outward. So this is a, a small patio that I built for a woman who has a beautiful garden in Portland. Um, this is the Halls Hill Labyrinth. I was commissioned by the couple. He invented the Adobe Illustrator. So they're very wealthy and they're environmentalists. So I did a project at their environmental school they built. And then they commissioned this labyrinth. And um, the World Labyrinth Society had a gathering here um, after they discovered it. Um, it uh, you turn at the cardinal points, it has 11 circuits and then the center. So there's actually 12 circles. Um, so representing the 12 months of the year. Um, and then the four seasons are, are represented in the colors as you move around. So you're walking through time and space again. Um, hundreds of thousands of people have walked it and it has lots of little symbols. Um, as people came down while I was building it, I would build a symbol for them. So there's hundreds of people that have, have a little memento in, in the mosaic so they can find that when they're walking on it. Um, this is a courtyard that I built for a woman that had a brick house. And so I kind of did the reverse of the brick by using concrete pavers and, and, and brick for the mortar in between. So kind of reversing that pattern. So blending in the architecture into the space and creating a courtyard, which um, this is kind of what you get when you buy a modern <laughs> construction. You get a heat pump <laughs> and a little concrete pad where the stairs came down, kind of an ugly stone wall. Um, so a friend of mine bought this. There, there were 20 of these row houses. Every, every different landscaper built each garden. Um, this is how the garden came out. So. So I built a patio that's like basically like a room. The, the, the patio is, the, is rectangular and like a carpet in the room. And then the plants are kind of like the furnishing and the art around the perimeter. So this is two years after now it's, it's much more mature and lush now. And the fence is covered with vines. And um, this is a couple that lived in Barcelona for four years. And so when I was walking through their house trying to, we were trying to figure out something that would be the inspiration for the design. And I saw this, uh, he had a windsurfing board that had a Miro constellation painting. He had commissioned this fiberglass art piece. 
And I was like, uh, this is my favorite thing I've seen so far. And he said, they said they love Miro. So I based their patio and uh, um, several parts of their garden on this Miro constellation painting. There's actually a vulva at the bottom because <laughs> this is a woman being um, communing with the universe. So she's uh, this is the painting that it's based on. So she's um, dispersed into the universe. She's become one with, with the cosmos. Um, they decided to take out their cracked front entryway. And so I built a, um, built this. Um, again, the kind of Miro-esque patterns are running through the stonework. And here's a detail of some of that. So. So everywhere you walk in the garden, even though it's changing and different motifs, it's, it still has this kind of thread running through it. Um, this is, um, basalt is the main stone in, in the Portland area, the native stone. And so it's very heavy and hard and thick. And I don't work with it anymore, but this is a garden that I built. Um, the wall mirrors the shape of the house, the architectural shape of the house and, and also the patio but then the path is like a zen natural path like you would find in a Japanese garden and that relates to the forest beyond so it's kind of melding the two together and you can sit on the wall and look out into the forest there's a little fountain creating the sound of water so these are spaces that you're supposed to stop and hang out in you don't you don't just pass through you're, you you really want to be there because they're like heavenly and um, this is a mosaic I built for Marietta and Ernie O'Byrne and Eugene. They're hellebore breeders. They've become very internationally famous for their hellebore breeding program. They have the most beautiful plant collection in the state of Oregon. And so this is a, represents um, all these different kinds of plants in their garden with the colors changing with the seasons. And they put a bed out here every night in the summer, an inflatable mattress, and they sleep out here so that they can wake up to all the hummingbirds zooming around because they have an extraordinary garden and it's filled with fragrance. And, and so they decided they wanted to sleep out here and they've been doing it for years now, sleeping out in the garden in the summer. Um, this is a project that I've been working on up in the Skagit Valley, north of Seattle in Washington. And um, I just built this patio that represents um, the rivers flowing out of the Cascades into Puget Sound. And so the stone in these flowing mosaics is actually collected from various rivers and then divided. So, so the Stillaguamish River running through here is all stone from the Stillaguamish and then all the stone in the Puget Sound area is collected from beaches on, in Puget Sound. And this is a detail of it while it was under construction. And I've created um, some maps of kind of Whidbey Island and Deception Pass. And so it was to bring the landscape of the region into this garden so that you have a connection. When you look out at the mountains, you, it, it's just kind of a bridge to the, to the landscape. This is the classical Chinese garden in Portland. And um, Portland has a sister city, Suzhou. Um, which is the garden city of China. So we built a rose garden for them. I think they got cheated. <laughs> so they, a bunch of scraggly roses and they built, they have a landscape architecture company there and they fabricated this entire thing and shipped it over and um, shipped, sent all these Chinese workers. And so I was going in and getting a hard hat and documenting them while they were building this garden. It's really incredible the way that the architecture and the garden integrate with each other. There's a big lake that runs through the whole thing. It's just a, um, this is a pavilion that's like a boat sitting on the water. Um, again, you just walk through this garden. There are lots of places to sit and just meditate on the landscape to just appreciate the beauty of, of and to be quiet and to stay still and to immerse yourself in the landscape rather than being distracted and moving on. We're always looking at our phones. We're always, you know, it's just amazing to me how disconnected we've become from nature. And so I think we as gardeners are looking, I mean, one of the reasons we garden is because we're seeking that reconnection with nature, you know, so, and it can be quite profound if you go to a molecular level or something. This is um, the Portland Japanese garden. It's considered the finest outside of Japan. Quite beautiful in the fall. 
and I go up there and I'll just sit and stare and kind of meditate on a place. And I see a lot of people walking around taking pictures and they're not really connecting to it, but it is built to be a place where you sit and meditate and contemplate and immerse yourself in the landscape. Um, this is a garden that I built in Portland, kind of based on uh, the Pacific Northwest and Japan have very similar climates. And so, um, so the landscapes can are translatable, I think. So this is a, a stone staircase leading up to a patio and with lush, um, a mixture of native and exotic plants. Um, this is the garden that I built in front of the homestead building in Glenarchy, New Zealand for this project. This um, Camp Glenarchy has the highest environmental standard of any accommodation in the world. It was commissioned by and built by the um, couple who, he's the adobe, the people that commissioned the labyrinth. So, so I used, uh, all the plants are New Zealand natives. Um, all the stone is local. I had a rock saw and I cut all of these pieces that I thought the parking area was so ugly with all these gray pavers. So I created this curb to distract your eye away from the pavement and to direct it into the garden. But the original landscape architecture plan from this was almost all concrete with little beds. It looked like a strip mall. And so I literally laid down when they <laughs> on the ground and said, you'll have to run over me with this tractor. <laughs> I'm doing a garden out here and you're not going to pave all of this like they had been doing with a lot of the rest of the um, landscape. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I do my work. So this is a path between my two houses. That's a Western rattlesnake. Um, you can see I use type S mortar. So this is a this is as much area as I can cover with a 80 pound bag of mortar that I mixed in a wheelbarrow with a hoe and all my stones are sorted. Um, it took me seven years to build this mosaic because the stones, like all the red is jasper. It's kind of rare and hard to find. Um, so I've spent hundreds of hours um, bent over and looking into the water and collect, collecting the rock for this mosaic. So um, I set them on edge so that they're well embedded in the mortar. Um, they're wet when I put them in so they stick to the mortar and then I put a piece of plywood on top and push it down. I used flexible lawn edging is that brown stuff behind it with with big nails and that's what I make my curved forms with. Um, I had to find thousands of rocks that were the same shape. So it's a very kind of tedious thing. So this is one end of the rattlesnake. And it's a protective symbol. It's something you see in Aztec culture. If you go to Angkor Wat, you see seven-headed cobras. All the railings around Angkor Wat, the largest temple in the world, are naga, these snakes, that, and they're protecting. They have protective energy. So because this was a crack house, I built a lot of symbolic totemic uh, mosaics. This is the other end. This is the baby snake at the other end. Seven years later, I finally finished it. Um, this is, it. I have a blog on how to make a pebble mosaic stepping stone. And so basically this is how I encourage people to start. Um, these are two by fours screwed together with an electric um, drill and, and it, it's two by four. So three and a half inches thick, um, screwed down to a piece of plywood so you can take it apart and pop it off. And you can see some finished mosaics panels at the top there. So these are, represent lotuses and they are uh, in when Buddha was born he, he, as a baby in, in the Jataka tales, the story of Buddha, when he when the baby first walked, lotus blossoms sprung from the ground. And so so this represents kind of that meditation walk where lotus blossoms would be springing from your feet. And I made each one different. So it would be interesting to look at each one. So when you're walking, you can like, it, they won't all be the same. So your mind reads them. You actually want to do it slowly and contemplate it. And if you do it barefoot, you get foot reflexology. It feels really wonderful. And this is the path that used to be asphalt that, um, where that fountain that I showed earlier on in that garden, um, and it represents kind of a, a stream with uh, rippling in the water so that they're going upstream and downstream when they come and go from their house. Um, I like to create spaces that invite nature into them because I think that it brings you, really bring, focuses you into the moment when you have birds around. So this is a picture in Sevilla of um, 
an elevated pool. I love that it was elevated so you can sit on the edge. Um, the pond in my garden is also elevated so you can sit on it and um, kind of the same design concept, raising it up. Um, this is the garden I built in San Francisco. And so uh, there are always birds and wasps and things coming to drink out of the fountain. Uh, hummingbirds come here a lot. They love the water jet and the splashing. Um, makes you feel like Snow White. Because <laughs> you know, my garden was filled with birds this year. It was really extraordinary how much um, my pesky squirrels, you know, everybody wants, I have raccoons coming way too often, but it's like a, it's a haven for wildlife. So um, this is my cousin's daughter. She's my Raphael muse. <laughs> and, um, so whenever they came to the house, they, she, whenever they left, she would be screaming because she didn't want to go, you know, because they just love the water and being around the pond and, and the discovery of nature. And so when I see them now, they still talk about how amazing it was to come when they were young and, you know, what a transformative experience it was coming into this kind of Eden paradise. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about lounging, how to inhabit your garden. These are this is in Palermo at the Botanical Garden. So turtles sun themselves, you know, they just sit and soak up the sun. So I thought, well, that's like a lounging thing. This is a Matisse painting. You know, um, you have you kind of have to learn how to do it. I've noticed with garden tours because I have carpets in my garden, people are afraid to lay down because it makes you vulnerable. It makes you have to let go of all this stuff that you're holding on to and you kind of become, you know, it's transformative. So it scares people. <laughs> I'm really surprised, but my friends are really good at it. You know, they come over and um, this is the Empress Josephine you know, in the Prado Museum. And then um, and, and another painting, I think this one's in Napoli in Italy, but that you see a lot of paintings where it kind of it, the mythological, the People laid down, you know, they reclined. <laughs> it was sensuous. It was, she's communing, the bird lands on her because she's quiet and she's, um, when you stare at enough of these paintings, you have a subconscious, <laughs> you know, you just lounge, you know. <laughs> of course, and they're not even looking at their cell phones because they're just, um, I watched a lot of I Dream of Jeannie when I was a kid. <laughs> so, and I really loved that bottle. You know, that was kind of my decor. This is, uh, this is in Meknes in Morocco. I love this room because you're laying on cushions on the floor. And it's a Moroccan thing. It's something they do in India as well. And um, it, it, so you're very present because you're relaxed. Um, this is the... Um, <clears throat> Oh dear, my brain, I'm getting senile. I'm having a brain fog. <laughs> but this is the um, Hawa Mahal in Jaipur. And this is where the harem of the Maharaja could view activities happening out on the street without being seen by anybody. They're looking through screens. So they're kept in port they're kept um, protected from the eyes of, of other people. Um, but I love that wall and I started buying these stone carvings in India and shipping them back. They had to go like a thousand miles over a bumpy pothole road to Mumbai and then they'd get shipped to Singapore and then to Los Angeles and put on a train. And then they wound up down at the airport at a customs place and I'd go pick them up. And eventually I built this wall. It's sort of my little Hawa Mahal. So it's like a, it's a niche wall and I have a beautiful collection of Buddhas and statuary. So those are all inhabiting. You want to elevate your Buddhas. I'm always seeing Buddhas in people's gardens on the ground. And that's very offensive to devout Buddhists. So it's important to build a platform and raise it up, so. One of the things that Maradian um, armies, when they conquered other Buddhist, you know, um, countries, they would or kingdoms, they would knock all their Buddhists down onto the ground to kind of take away their power. So it's bad karma. So make sure and raise your Buddhas up. Um, I have a bed in the garden for lounging because I like to lay there. There's a clawfoot bathtub underneath it. I'll talk about bathing later. Um, but it's carpeted. I have pebbles on the ground, so it's clean. It dries out really quickly and I can roll the carpets out and people come over and and lay around. You know, I go out 
every day and lay on this bed instead of sitting or running around. I actually lay down and relax and commute, listen to the water and watch the birds. And um, this is the meditation pavilion that I built for Brooke Adams and Tony Shalhoub in Los Angeles um, with the smell of the Brugmansia. And, and you look down the steps, which were made out of a uh, the roof of an old Indian uh, um, swing that they had that had rotted and fallen apart. So we refabricated those into steps and I built this threshold at the bottom with eight pointed stars. Um, they had a sunken trampoline in the original design. I was just hired to do a mosaic when I first went there and they hired me to come back and redo the whole garden because it was so ugly. And so I took this trampoline out and there was a big hole and we talked about building a pond and but then I was like, well, it's Los Angeles and I wanted to make the garden more water wise. And so I said, well, why don't we just build a sunken garden out of it? And so he called, Tony always called it Brooks Folly, but I did mosaic around the rim. We um, stuccoed the interior and painted a, um, a beautiful stencil design around it. And then, and with these stepping stones leading up to it. And now it's this, sunken garden that you walk down into it's a little bit it's cooler on hot days and there's a fountain um, these are the steps leading down into the into the garden so they're they're nice to sit on just to to admire the space um, it's really nice to paint things instead of just painting them a solid color you can do embellishment um, to make it more beautiful more interesting to look at um, that's that motif running around it. And then we, it, the center's on the fountain. Um, this is a garden that I built in San Francisco. And so the mosaic is of a lotus. Um, the people, he has a sock company. He made socks that Japanese schoolgirls started to wear. So we actually found a Japanese medallion. And then I did a, um, that is this pattern that represents a family. They put in a bathtub as well so that they can bathe in the garden. And this is, and they have a three-story house with balconies. So this is looking down from above onto the mosaic. So it's a really wonderful garden too. And we always said, when nobody's looking, this turns. <laughs> it's like rotating and then it stops when, when you look. So um, the dog has a place to lounge, um, a very luxurious <laughs> bed outside the kitchen. Um, this is tile work that I did um, based on Pietra Dura work from the Taj Mahal in Lightstone. Um, like now lounging in the garden and grapes. This is sort of a, <laughs> grapes seem to have a, have a kind of a classic depiction. You know, there's something about the sumptuousness of grapes. <laughs> this is outside the Colosseum in Rome and you pay money and these guys dressed as gladiators or whatever, give you a cluster of <laughs> rubber grapes and you have your picture taken, but it's supposed to depict this kind of decadent, you know, thing. So this is a, a um, painting inspired by Pompeii of a party a garden party with lots of fruit, mostly grapes and wine. And when you invite satyrs to parties, they turn into kind of wild orgies. And the Romans were very sensual and sexual. And um, that was kind of privatized and wiped out by the Catholic church when it came into Italy. So, so but it was a very pleasure-based culture. Um, this is um, my neighbor's daughter, wanted to celebrate her 18th birthday in my garden. And so, so they had a very, a very decadent you know, party of these girls, but I had to leave because I thought I was going to get arrested if the police showed up or something because they were having a good time. This is like a typical brunch in my garden, you know, people laying around on the carpets and they often go all day, you know, people don't leave because they become so relaxed. And um, it's just this concept of, you know, you lay down, you're gonna stay longer. If you have music in the garden, then it's, you lay down and listen to the music. So um, this is the harp player that we, when we dedicated the labyrinth, my client asked if I would like to have music. And I said, I think a harp would be just so beautiful. And so this guy played all day and a couple hundred people came and it was just a magical event. Um, 
this is a party in my garden that went on for three days. It was a group from, that I camp with at Burning Man. So, so it's kind of like, I mean, it's sort of like a Pompeian style party. It was very decadent. And, um, this is a, in Granada, again, at the Alhambra. So this is water running down the um, balustrade. So you can trail your hand in the water while you're walking through the garden to cool yourself, splash it on yourself. Um, this is in the Villa de Este, another, you know, just beautiful. It gets very, very hot there in the summer. So you have this cool water right at your fingertips. Um, I float flowers in my gardens. In the summer, I take lots of dahlias and float them in the bowls. It's something that I kind of took from Morocco. This is a hotel in Marrakesh where they, every day they bring rose petals and fill the fountains with, with rose petals. A very beautiful kind of a way to embellish your gardens. This is in Antigua and Guatemala, a fountain that they filled with calla lilies. It's just incredible. What a beautiful bouquet. And this is in Calcutta at the flower um, market by the Howard Bridge and they make marigold garlands, like miles and miles and miles of marigold garlands. Just the smell of marigolds takes me back to this place. But um, they, they garland statues and, and buildings for weddings and cars. And but, so I make marigold garlands for my Buddha for when I have garden tours. Um, it's just a nice way to honor the, the deities and create kind of a magical presence. Um, this is Narcissus and, <laughs> and um, Echo. Echo is, has lost Narcissus to his reflection. Um, this is me being Narcissus in a hot pool <laughs> at, in, on the big island of Hawaii where I went this winter. It was the only place I could go in the winter for COVID. And I'd never been to Hawaii, so it forced me to go there. And, I went to this place like eight times because it was such a magical, beautiful place to bathe. Um, this is called Las Posas. It's in um, Mexico, up in the mountains in the Sierra Oriental towards the Gulf of Mexico. This was a, um, an Englishman that had the largest collection of surrealist art in the world, bought this um, beautiful piece of jungle outside of the town and built this surrealist garden over a period of about 30 years. And so these are bathing pools. Um, they even had like trampolines. You could jump off of platforms and bounce off the trampoline and land in the pool. And um, this is a step well in India. So this was built for was it at Hampi, the um, beautiful ruins at Hampi in the state of Karnataka. And so they were meant to, so that you could get to the water to bathe and collect water and, and they fill up during the monsoon. And then as the water level drops, it goes down these incredible steps. This is the swimming pool at the Hotel La Mamunia. So um, a pool can be a really beautiful thing. I mean, Americans, we make them about as ugly as you can usually, but they can be an extraordinary thing if you treat water as like the sacred element that it, it, it can be deserving of this. I think that Mick Jagger has laid on this bed before. <laughs> um, this is in Sri Lanka, um, incredible. They had torrential rains when we were there and it flooded these ruins, but it filled the royal pools and the war was going on at that time. And so we were able to, we were the only people there. And so we swam in these pools and, it was, and it's hot and tropical there. So it was so wonderful to swim in these gorgeous pools in the cool water. This is at Mandu again in India. And so this was used in the film, Marinaire's film Kama Sutra because the Sultan where I'm standing is a, was a throne and he could watch his harem bathe in these pools down below. This is Cleopatra's baths in Kamakali in Turkey. And um, it's a hot spring that an Apollo temple collapsed into um, during an earthquake at Hierapolis there. And so these are all, you're, you're Eastern European tourists bathing in the hot springs, but it's, again, you know, I always wanted to have a hot spring in my garden. This is Kevin Forrest's garden in um, San Jose. He has the most extraordinary. When people came, when the hortosexuals came to my garden for a tour, they kept coming up to me and asking me if I knew Kevin Forrest. And I hadn't met him yet, but we've become good friends and 
because he has the largest collection of imported stone carving in the United States, maybe. Um, tons and tons and tons. It's an incredible garden. If you ever get a chance, just amazing. Um, I, in Hawaii, I um, spent some time with Davis Dahlbach, who's a designer from, he lives in Fairfax um, in Marin County, but he has a 20-year-old garden on the big island, the lava just skirted by it, it's south of Hilo. Um, but this is a pool, above it is a pool that he's developing as a hot pool, like the ones down on the coast that I was soaking in. So it will be like a hot tub, but it'll be a pool surrounded with lava rock and like a wild pool with this amazing bromeliad collection. Um, this is at Lotus Land in Montecito, um, Ganawalska's garden. I think it's just one of the trippiest, you know, wild gardens. And I think that they, this shallow pool that she would have parties and people would costume and then you could wade in this pool and splash each other. It's like, it's a wading pool. Now it's just or ornamental, but the giant clam fountains. I mean, she was so decadent. And, and I find that decadence inspiring. And I think that more is more if you do it right. You know? So um, this is another water house painting of just the idea of bathing. You know? So a, a harem that doesn't get to go out, but they have this beautiful surrounding. So this is kind of a classic image of you know, taking a bath. This is Davis Dahlbach's pool, um, bathing pool on his deck off, off of his house in Hawaii. And this is um, the bathtub in my garden. I have a huge kind of peppermint candy striped camellia that is just laden with flowers in the spring. So I pick a ton of them and someone can come over and take a camellia bath <laughs> in the garden in the spring. Um, there I'm taking a bath. It's so wonderful to take a hot bath in the garden and just relax to you, you. I have jasmine planted around it, the huge, um, the trellis is covered with jasmine. So a couple of months of fragrance and then, and then very detailed um, plants that are amazing to look at up close so that you can just gaze at them. Um, it's a wonderful thing to have. You just take a clawfoot tub. I put a hot water tap on the outside of the house. Um, plumbed and then I have a hose that's just buried under the ground that runs over to the tub and I fill it up with hot water and I took one last night. I can stay in for about two hours when the water is really, really hot. So it's quite fabulous. Um, and then the idea of lighting. So um, lighting is a hard thing in gardens because we, again, it's one of those things I thought if I was really entrepreneurial, I would start developing a line of lighting because I think when you go and try and buy something for a landscape, it's pretty awful. So I think Morocco has it dialed in. They have wonderful lanterns and they cast incredible patterns. So I have a collection of Moroccan lanterns and it's kind of like creates this almost like starry night all over everything. Uh, it's quite wonderful. This is the lantern shop in Marrakech. And um, this is Kevin Forrest Garden. So one of the most recent things that he's done, he had a, he has a huge collection of objects, and he had all these wire bird cages, and so he set up a whole wiring system and suspended all of these bird cages throughout the garden, and they cast these incredible shadows all over the all over the pavements and the sculptures. It's just like being in a dream when you're in this garden. He's done such an incredible thing. This is a trellis in my garden. I've done also, I have steel fences and steel trellises um, so that they'll never rot and have to be replaced. And I put lantern, I put candles in the lanterns and when the wind blows, the temple bells ring and um, it transports you to another world. This is an arch that in the front of my house that is based on a set of carved stone arches that I have in my basement that were too big to use. I'm waiting for some really, really wealthy client to buy them from me so I can build a, install them in their garden and build something. Um, my current client wants to build a um, working farm with a produce stand. And so I'm proposing that we build a wisteria trellis like the ones in Japan. Um, so that they can do alfresco farm to table dining under this during when the wisteria is in bloom, you know, to create a shady space. So 
that would be very decadent. Wisteria is used heavily in Italy and they know how to prune them. So, cause it's like having Medusa, the snakes <laughs> taking over your garden. I took mine out cause it was too much work. But um, if you cut them all back, you know, then, so this trellis would be hanging with Wisteria normally. And when you walk down this path to the edge in Ravello, you look out over this incredible view of the Amalfi coast. And, and it's just takes your breath away, you know, and you feel again connected to the universe. And this is a mosaic I did with the phase of the moon with a spiral galaxy for a client with, with niches to put candles in and to do ceremonies and to commune with the universe. So it's just a way of expanding yourself and becoming part of the world. Then you swoon and you have the angels come down. You have this kind of you know, profound experience. Um, the nymphs appear you know, and you have this just magical, magical space. So, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Walking my talk here. So this is a burning man in my camp, but. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's the end of the lecture. Wow. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. Um so I'm getting a clawfoot tub immediately. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. It's really it's, great. It's, I've made notes. I um I already have a porch bed, so I had a portion of this, but the tub is what I need. Yeah, and you can put a platform on top of the tub to keep the debris out of it and put a bed on top of that too. So my garden's small, so it makes it so you can. I, I, yep. I'm so excited. I'm going to go on Facebook Marketplace right when we're done here. <laughs> yeah, and find a tub and then you can use the water to water your garden. So I, yes. let it, I let it cool off in the tub and then I just scoop it out in buckets and pour it into the beds and yeah. it all gets recycled. Oh. And so in the summer I do all my bathing outside so I don't waste any water. So great. I, um, it, some of the, the comments on the chat were about the water. And uh, I said, you know, I was having water envy. There's just so much water around here. And uh, yeah, we have more a lot more water up here. So although no, I actually wait. like doing I liked working in Southern California. I think I mean we we all want to grow agaves here, it seems like. And no. <laughs> even though I would only have one eye if I was gardening in South be <laughs> <laughs> poked out and <laughs> so it's um but I, I like water wise gardening and I like, I mean, like those images of the Alhambra and stuff, that's a very arid climate. And so in Morocco and all around the Mediterranean, they use their water very judiciously by, by creating these, you know, using it to its uh, maximum effect. Um, Stuart's asking for your mosaic pass, do you set the mortar right on the ground or is there a liner on the ground that the mortar was on? Um, I put a, um, I do a crushed bed of compacted gravel if I'm building like a large mosaic. Um, I use rebar also in it to reinforce it so it won't crack later. Um, and you, you, and I do it in sections. So, um, you know, by, by the 80 pound bag. So that gives you, I, I leave a margin. If I'm doing a mosaic where I'm continuing on from one spot to the next, I leave a margin of mortar and mosaic up to a point about six inches away from that. And then I take a trowel and dig that drying mortar out once it's set up so that there's no slumping of the mosaic. And then I kind of mash that down in the bottom and put a fresh bed of mortar on top of that. Okay. And continue onward. So I put in the chat, people, and I'll try to do it again. Um, a link to jeffreygardens.blogspot.com, which is Jeffrey's blog, where there's um, just a myriad of things there in tutorials, instructions, and all, so that you can. Um, mimic him. Um, Give it a try. I mean, I, that's why I said make a stepping stone because then you yes. won't be stuck with. You can haul it or put it behind the garage if it's ugly or something. <laughs> Your first one's going to come out. I mean, if you follow the instructions 
you know, doing the sand, you know, setting up the whole thing, you're going to wind up with a nice mosaic. And I have taught some workshops and they're really hard work, so I don't do it anymore. So sure. you know, I have to bring in like, you know, two tons yeah. of material. And, and sure. so, um, so that brings up a bunch of questions about where you get your stones. And I heard you say, or I thought I heard you say that they're organized by color. Yeah, uh, color and shape. So depending on what the design is. So like that mosaic that had the rivers flowing into Puget Sound, that's all. I mean, one of the reasons I like doing that is it's really just shape. I mean, I'm, I'm putting them together so they complement each other and they're beautiful, but it's more like looking at stones in the river. And and do you all, buy them or do you mix so you, them? You can buy um, Mexican beach pebbles. Um, I mean, it depends on the stone yard. And when I was working in LA, I, I hauled everything down because it takes so long to sort everything. So mm -hmm. I sorted everything in advance, but then I ran out of some red that I needed and I found a stone yard in, I think Gardena or something. And it was a big stone yard and they had a lot of pebbles. So when I do a pebble mosaic lecture, I show like places where you can buy them there may be bins but you have to get permission because you're going to be there for hours hanging over the bin it's not very fun <laughs> <laughs> looking because it's not like you're just scooping them out and they're all the yeah. right shape you have to look at each one and go no that one's no good that one's no good that one's no good and then you finally it's like oh this one's good and it's very tiring yeah so and so is the finished product design based on you have so many of a stone color and so it's going to be this big because you can't make it any bigger and then you're going to add to it or do you oh, just sure. keep waiting until like, you get the enough of that color yeah i mean if it's a big mosaic i have to gather everything before i build it so so it's just, so I may spend like, I mean, the labyrinth I was going out and collecting every day at the end of the day, I would go and fill, go down to this beach that had an amazing assortment because there's 12 colors in the labyrinth. So it's actually, um, it was the largest lumber mill in the world and the largest shipbuilding yard in the world for 40 years on Bainbridge Island at Blakely Harbor because they cut down all the trees in Puget Sound and shipped them all over the world and ships would come in with ballast. So they brought stone from all over the world and threw it into the ocean. And so there's a two mile long beach that has maybe 30, 40 different types of minerals. Plus it's metamorphic rock there already that was brought by glaciation. So you get a, a huge variety of stuff in glaciated areas. So that's why I like working up in Northern Washington. Um, you won't have that in San Diego. You're gonna find, um, I mean, there's a lot of rock in the ground, you know, but it's all going to be round. And um, I would say if you went to a stone yard, you'll probably be able to get Mexican beach pebbles, which are the black and uniform. Okay. Although they're not, they've, they've been, they sell Mexican beach pebbles everywhere. So they've been quarried out. And the bags used to have a lot of uniformity and really beautiful pebbles. And now when I buy them and you open it up, it's like they're all lumpy and none of them are flat. And it's, you get a very small percentage that are actually usable. So it's not as good of a source. I'd say find a beach that has a lot of pebbles on it. Um, bring a, a little cooler like that you'd put drinks in to put them in so it's discreet. <laughs> you don't want to be down there with buckets and look like you're just plundering the beach you know you have to do it in a way that because people are going to well, do you have a permit you know it's like where are you going to go get a permit to collect rocks during covid <laughs> you know, or a permit to collect rocks who's who authorized i think you'd need to do it in a conscious and responsible way so i don't take anything that has anything living on it or underneath it i put it back if there's crabs underneath it or something you know I try to have minimal impact. Well, we like sand at our beaches. So if there's no sand, I think that rocks taking helps <laughs> because they're going to be bringing sand in so that they're, that we have sandy beaches. So we might be able to make it that we're helping. Uh -huh. but that's, that's a stretch. And it's the beach covered with pebbles. Yeah. It's illegal without a permit. Yeah. 
but what's you know sure. you can go to a stoneyard and buy it but they're strip mining it so there's like there's going to be a backhoe down in the riverbed totally tearing up the riverbed and creating a quarry mess you know you buy gravel it comes from a gravel pit it's devastating to riparian habitats gravel quarrying so so i think that collecting from the wild responsibly has a Oh, getting getting a permit yeah so and there's no you know i mean it's i have never i've been doing this for years and i there's no like office where you go to get a permit you know you might from the forest service to collect like big stones if you were building a wall or something but collecting pebbles is a um, usually I'm just filled my pockets or something like most people do and then I bring those home and uh, you, you keep doing it until you have enough so but how I, many I, pockets I, do you have <laughs> not, on a, not on a state beach like San Alejo or someplace like that yeah you yeah. should do it in a state park or a national park for sure you know unless you're picking a few or something you really shouldn't do it in um the still a guamish where i collect it's like a i pick up all the garbage it's my favorite collecting river in northern washington it goes right under interstate five and it's a big fishing beach a two mile long rock bank that is continuously replenished every winter by you know thousands of tons of stone being washed down when the river floods and people go there and fish and throw them incredible amounts of garbage on the beach. It's really horrifying how, how unconscious people are about garbage. So I pick up all the garbage when I'm collecting the rock and I leave the beach in better condition than it was when I came. So I feel like I'm doing a payback. You know? And a lot of that is going to be tribal land. So just be warned. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm totally aware. I wouldn't go on. I mean, it's not still a Guamish tribal land. It really is more like a people go there and dump truckloads of garbage and stuff. It's more of a, it's a, it's just a, just a, you drive down a road and there's some paths through the blackberries and then this long, you know, so. And it, but again, it's, I'm taking the tiniest, you would, you, I never, you would never know I'm there. So. The stones that I'm collecting are specific shapes, so it'll be one in several hundred will be the right shape. And so I'm just, I'm not like pulling a whole area out and stripping it. I'm picking a couple of stones and then moving over five or six feet and collecting a couple more and, you know, just making my way. So it's just, you're just plucking a few, you know, specific, it's really about a nice flat top and vertical per perpendicular sides so they fit tightly together and there's a flat surface on the top. The, um, I'm, I'm saving the chat because it's everybody's so inspired and I want to be able to share with you all the accolades. Um, there was a question and now I've lost it. Um, well, I had a question about the labyrinth. So my understanding about a labyrinth is that there's, you, you walk it to the center mm -hmm. and there's, you're, there's something that you're supposed to be thinking about. And then maybe I, I misunderstood. And then when you walk back out, it's like, you get an answer if you were thinking about a question. Is that the um, way that's, it works? That's one way to use it. I mean, the, that particular labyrinth, and a lot of them are, there's different sizes. So it's an 11 circuit labyrinth. So it's based on the Chartres Cathedral. It's a medieval labyrinth. And that one represented when you walked it, because it requires patience, which people don't have. So you know, a lot of times people will walk to the center and then just walk out without retracing because it requires some dedication to do it but it was considered to be a um, uh, um, akin to making the pilgrimage to the holy land which most people couldn't do so they would walk the walk the labyrinth as a meditation in in the church it's on okay. the church and so that's the one that the, the one at grace cathedral in san francisco i think is the most walked labyrinth in the world and it's a copy of the charts one it has a crenellate Mm -hmm. uh, exterior ring road center and I didn't want to do, mine's based on Native American mythology so it's a medicine wheel with 12 the 12 colors oh. represent the seasons and so and then the the symbols within it are totemic so 
The okay. outer ring has 12 moons in it. So that's the 12 full moons of the year that relates also to the 12. There's a center, a hole in the center instead of being a solid circle in the middle. And that's a place to put offerings. So people often bring something to put in the middle, okay. which makes it so a lot of people walk to the middle because they want to see what people have left. You know? <laughs> and then people take things because they people leave valuable objects in there sometimes. I've had people write me and say, I moved after 30 years in a house and I buried my apartment key in there, you know, or my house key after I moved because it was this, the end of a period of my life and moving on. And so, so it's really cool. It, it becomes, it develops collective energy. So um, the inner yeah. nine, the outer one is a lunar circuit, then the 10th circuit is a Tibetan mala, so it has a eight moons in it, making a necklace. And yeah. then the year nine are the nine planets, so it represents the cosmos or the, the solar system of our, you know, the suns. And the sun is the middle, and then there's, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth. The Earth circuit has a whole bunch of objects that people donated, so it's called the community circuit. Again, that connects it to the community. So it has a ton of, there's 13 blogs on the essays that describe the whole process of building it, showing you know, each circuit as it was being built, the people that I met, I would take a portrait of them and then the, the little symbol that I built for them, um, the conversations we'd have. You know, um, A few people died while I was working on it. Um, Bainbridge Island's a very wealthy island. So three mothers who'd lost their, they can, their kids can go to Seattle and buy meth. And so there were three meth overdoses, you know, kids had died and mothers who would come there to grieve. And, and so it became a very, very meaningful and deep place that has a, you know, it has a soul to it kind of because it's so profound and intense. That's amazing. I, um, I've only done one labyrinth and that was a lavender labyrinth. Um, it, here locally, uh -huh. and and it um, it was impacted, of course, by the fact that by walking the labyrinth with the plants around, there was fragrance, uh -huh. and um, so it was I, I wanted to do more. Uh -huh. So lavender was planted in the circle. yes, it was a specific variety of lavender that was planted along the edges of the labyrinth and so as you walked it it was very thin you couldn't help but release the fragrance oh, right you'd be brushing against the flowers it and... was it, it was pretty spectacular and so i've all i've always been interested since then of visiting more and i haven't but that's my only experience but i I've, I've learned in research that they're mostly uh, like what you've made and there's not plant material in there that you're rubbing up against. It's, it's a path generally. So yeah, the, yeah. Night, the gaps between are open and permeable because I wanted it to actually breathe and I wanted water to go. I didn't want to make a paved surface that covered the whole area. So it's just the path and then, and then, um, and things that grow in the, mushrooms come up in the in the spaces and this when it rains and so it's actually kind of cool that it and squirrels bury nuts and things and so but it's um it, it has some benefit to nature yeah you know, and the and the trees that grow around it can have root systems underneath the labyrinth because they still get moisture it's not sealed okay so it was how do your how like, do your I'm sorry how do your rugs hold up outdoors in the Pacific Northwest? Oh, I roll them up if it's like it, we're finally going to have an inch of rain. They say on Friday this week, so for the first time since April, we haven't really had any rain since April. It's the driest year okay. in history, and so we're so I just roll them up and put them in the basement. Okay, okay, and ten minutes to put the whole garden away and <laughs> all the pillows and. Yeah, it's I um there is a labyrinth. Susie uh, reminds me there's a labyrinth at uh, Alta Vista Gardens in uh, uh, the botanical garden in Bringle Terrace Park here in Vista. And I think so, there's a labyrinth finder website, and so there's probably I bet there's over a dozen in the San Diego area. If you yeah, look, usually they're made of those little cast concrete blocks, so they're not. You just are walking it, but you're not really paying attention to what you walk on. Whereas people, when I watch them walk on the one that I built, they're 
totally staring at it because the colors are changing and you really notice that you're moving from one color to the next and you're moving through time and space. It, it, it's like a journey here. You know? And then you see these all these symbols. And so if you know the story, it is quite interesting to recognize all these things that were built for people. It's like, you know, they're... It's, it's, it's wonderful. I'm, um, I'm wondering if there's any more questions. Oh, there's the Church of the Brethren on Westgate Place in zip code 92105 has an outdoor labyrinth. You can walk. Okay. Well, yep. I'm going to be walking labyrinths. Uh, people. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, and, go ahead and check them out. Yeah. Have you, have you ever been to Queen Khalifa's? I think we talked about it earlier, but Queen Khalifa's Magical Circle in Escondido, that's a great place to go. It's like, because it's totally, it's all surrounded by mosaic snakes, giant snakes, the wall, and then it has all these totems inside and very eccentric, but quite wonderful. Yeah. I, you're the first to tell me about it, so I'm going to be looking it up. Yeah, major, major installation down there. So it's in a city park. Okay. Yeah, quite wonderful. You hear that? That's the Jackie St. Paul. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah. Garden. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, she's kind of an inspiration for me because I mean, her work is it's not my style, but it but it always tells a story, you know, and it's very it's very much I think that what I try to encourage people when they're doing their gardens rather than, you know, because we tend to you buy ornaments you know, and you put them in there and but does it mean something to you what does it represent you know so what so i think that it, what the best you can do is to kind of create your own mythology and build build something that is personal and really represents who you are and what your history is and what you're you know that you develop that and it becomes more special than if you just went out and bought a, you know, whirly gig. And a, <laughs> you know. I mean, I encourage putting bird baths and things in gardens because you want to provide water for wildlife and birds. And, and so yeah, I think that the, a garden should always benefit nature as much as possible. And it should, but it should also benefit you by providing sustenance and, and again, triggering that consciousness so that you're, it, it elevates your consciousness being in your garden because it's special. Well, I, mean, I like that more is more. Frankly. More is more, yeah. More is more. Right, yeah. I mean, I tend to do a very simple structure to my gardens. Often, like, if it's a fenced space, then it's like a room, you know, it's like the walls of the room. You don't put a bunch of curvy furniture and, you, you know, you'd put a couch against the wall, and <laughs> but you furnish it kind of like a room so that it's, functional and efficient you know you're using the space to its maximum benefit so mine is very rectangular i mean i wanted it to be architectural but at the same time all the materials are very natural so it has a lot of um, well there's a lot of curves within the collective things that you've made into a rectangular wall yeah, there's stones and stuff but everything else yeah. is, but all the walls are straight and so it's very to give it an order that is simple. So a lot of people would have made it really curvy and kind of undulating and just from- Me, I would have. <laughs> but if you have more space, then curves make more sense. Again, if you're, if you're relating to space, you know, a lot of natural forms out in the garden, but my garden's only 33 feet wide. So it's quite tiny. Well, it looks bigger than that because you have these huge snakes running across them. Yeah, uh -huh. well, and I did that because it's undulating. So it makes the path look like it's twice as long because it's curving. Yeah, so so the edge of it is curving. So it makes the that line is much longer because it's going like this instead of straight. But well, it's, it, it, it's- They're little design tricks for him. Yeah, I love that the artwork that you showed that had mosaic in it and or inspired mosaic uh, was great because the artistry of the garden is, you know, it's a it's ethereal in that in that sense. And so when you we're doing it, it's what kind of art are we drawn to and 
than what kind yeah, of should be something that inspires. I mean, you think of things that you love, you know, what, what are the things that you really love? And that's what I would depict, you know, so in, in the garden to recreate. And I think if you travel, you, you, you know, it's worth bringing something back, a memento that you can place that well, that's you it, it reminds you of that place. You know? Yeah, postcards. Yeah, yeah. I have been bringing, but uh -huh. and <laughs> then bring shells and stones. <laughs> yeah, so stones are you know, and shells. I have a lot of them, obviously, but I but I remember where I collected them because you know, there's the memory of you know, oh, that stone came from that that beautiful day on that river, and yeah. You know, so I do a medallion every year with what I've collected during the year, just my, the ones that are in my pocket, because it takes all your, you know, I'll just bring home and put them in buckets and then I'll make a, so I went to Egypt and Israel and Jordan one winter. And so I have stones, you know, the bag of stones that I collected on that trip that I brought home. And so I can spot them and go, oh, that's from Aswan and that's from here. Wow. And so there wow. so it represents all the tra everything collectively winds up in there and it just builds upon itself. I can't thank you enough, Jeffrey, for this. It's just fabulous. Yeah, thank you. That's fine. I'm I'm going to uh, uh, be sending you an email follow up uh, tomorrow. And, okay. Uh, and with the connection so, to send to the person I need to send that my yep so. yep all of that will be tomorrow and uh, if if there's any more questions people can unmute themselves and uh for a couple minutes and then we're gonna let Jeffrey uh, go so if you have a question and you want to ask it directly feel free to unmute yourself before we let him depart. And I do have that page on Facebook, um, Gardens by Jeffrey Bale. So, and you can send me messages on Messenger. I check it pretty regularly so I can answer questions there. And, um, and I post images of work and inspiration and articles that I think are worth reading. So, and links to my blog when I write an essay, I put a link there. And so, wonderful. It's possible to follow that way. Yeah. And I try to make it entertaining, so it's not a bunch of garbage. It's actually <laughs> you're learning something and seeing beautiful things. So. Oh, you people that here um, this evening, guests watching this have been following you, and they were very excited to be listening oh, okay. to your yeah. talk. Yeah, so. I'm a follower, so yeah, imagine. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. All right, Jeffrey. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.